Recently, we discussed the most difficult and puzzling of all of Jesus' parables. Well, today, we're going to discuss the most misunderstood of all of Jesus' parables. So, here we go again. We're going to take a look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, which is the so-called story of the rich man and Lazarus. And a little bit of warning, parts of this message are going to be hell. But hang in there anyway. Here we go. Before we get into the text itself, there are a few basic ground rules we need to establish that will affect our interpretation and understanding of this parable. First of all, this is a parable. Now, some argue that the account of the rich man and Lazarus is not a parable, and some would even suggest it's a true story. Well, the main argument here is that one of the two protagonists in the story is named, and no one is given a name in any of the other of Jesus' parables. Now, this seems like a bit of a flimsy argument to me, as the name used, Lazarus, may indeed be used symbolically. It was a common name at the time and commonly found in the Old Testament. In fact, it was the Hebrew name uh, Eleazar of the servant of Abraham. This may indeed be relevant to the story. In the Greek version of the Hebrew name, Eleazar, which means God has helped, it becomes Lazarus in the Greek. And the name, meaning God has helped, may be very relevant to the meaning of the story. Now, Jesus begins the story the same way he did the four previous parables. There was a certain man, there was a certain woman, there was a certain rich man, there was a certain rich man, all parables. Parables are a form of storytelling that utilize imagery, symbols, exaggeration, hyperbole, metaphors, and figures of speech. The story of the rich man and Lazarus appeared to have these features. Now, parables also contain incidental details that, while not pertinent to the meaning of the story, serve to flesh out the story and to give it color. Now, parables usually have one main point. Sometimes uh, there may be a few variations on that point, but generally speaking with a parable, you want to look for what's the point. The incidental details of the story should not be pressed for precise meanings or are made into allegories. That's a mistake. Now, in this parable, Jesus uses imagery of the afterlife. Imagery which the Pharisees would have understood and agreed with, and this made the parable particularly applicable to them. Now, other Jewish sects, such as the Sadducees, would not have accepted the imagery that Jesus used of the afterlife. The Sadducees took a conservative view of Scripture, interpreting it for what it said, especially the five books of Moses. The Pharisee had a more liberal view of interpreting Scripture, relying on interpretations made by teachers and by traditions. And some of their interpretations and traditions were influenced by Greek thought and, along with that, the thinking of other cultures as well. Remember, Jesus often rebuked the Pharisees for not listening to Moses and the prophets. Now, it's even possible that in this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, that Jesus is offering a parody of the Pharisees' view of the afterlife in order to make a point to them. Well, at any rate, the imagery cannot be taken literally. As with all parables, we must look for what's the point, and that's what we're going to seek to do. All right, let's look then at Luke chapter 16, <clears throat> beginning in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. All right, let's look at this verse a little more closely. There was a certain rich man. Now, you may have heard this rich man given a name, Dives. Well, Dives is not really a name. It's just uh, in the Latin version of the Bible, the Latin word for rich. Dives means rich. So there was a rich man. Now, this rich man, I think we're going to see, is a type of the Pharisees. Jesus is directing this parable to the Pharisees 
And I think he wants to see them identify with the rich man. So there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. Fine linen underclothing. Purple robes like a king, like a monarch. Must have been extremely wealthy. And he lived in luxury. And the Greek here really means celebrated in splendor. So he had a celebration. He rejoiced, listen to this, every day. Not just on special occasions. This man dressed in royal garb and had a celebration every single day. This was his whole purpose in living, was to celebrate like this in luxury. Verse 20. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. At his gate, that's interesting. The Greek word translated gate there means a very big gate, a high, middle, ornamented gate like you would see entering a city, entering a castle, entering a mansion. And that's what we see here. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. Now, could Luke be sending us a mission here as he tells this story of a beggar at the gate, a proselyte of the gate, it was called, when a Gentile began to worship the God of Israel and pay attention to the law of Moses, they were often called a stranger at the gate. And remember, Luke's audience is Gentile Christians at the end of the first, beginning of the second century. Luke may have wanted to include this parable. It only appears in the Gospel of Luke. So he may have wanted to include it as an also a message of encouragement to his Gentile Christian readers at any rate. So at his gate was laid a beggar, was laid. Now, a strong version of the verb there could mean dumped, but probably he was simply laid, friends, family, someone put him there. Now, what would that tell you? That would tell you he perhaps could not move or walk on his own, that he had to be laid there at the gate every day. Why at the gate? Well, that's where the traffic was, people coming and going. That's where he hoped to receive some help, some almsgiving, perhaps. So he was laid, a beggar. Now, the Greek doesn't have beggar, per se. It has poor, and with the implication of a poor man. This was a poor man, and his name was Lazarus. God has helped. Well, it doesn't certainly seem like God has helped him, but at least not at this point in the story. The name Lazarus, and he was covered with sores. Uh, the Greek means he was ulcerated. So this poor man is lying there. Perhaps he can't move about, and he's filled with ulcers. Verse 21, and longing to eat, to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. He was hoping to get some garbage. He was hoping to do some dumpster diving. He was hoping to get scraps from the master's table. Did he get them? The story doesn't tell us. But he was longing to eat. It doesn't say he ate. It says he was longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now some might say, well, that was nice. No, it wasn't nice. Uh, they were probably feral dogs. They could have infected his wounds. And here's, I think, the point. The rich man is eating, filling his tongue with all kinds of delights. The dogs are licking with their tongues. They're feeding, in a sense, on Lazarus. There's only one character in the story who's hungry, who's not eating, whose tongue is not being allowed to taste food or drink, and that's Lazarus. So even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22. The Greek says, And it happened that, or the NIV, the time came when the beggar died. Now you have to wonder, did he starve to death? Did his ulcerated condition finally get to him? We don't know. Incidental, not pertinent to the meaning of the story. Here's what is pertinent. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, or Abraham's lap, literally, or as the King James says, Abraham's bosom. Now, that's figurative language. What do I mean by figurative? Well, 
figurative in a couple of ways. The imagery may here be of Abraham hosting a banquet, and he's invited Lazarus to sit at his right hand, reclining at table, leaning into his bosom as the honored guest at a banquet. But it certainly means a, a, a wonderful reward. Lazarus is finally eating, maybe feasting, and he's experiencing bliss for the first time in his life. Now, if you take it literally, uh, the angels carried him in Abraham's bosom. Did it carry every good person into Abraham's bosom? Well, if it did, Abraham's bosom got pretty crowded. You know, I mean, Abraham's chest only has room for so many people. It's a story. It's a parable. Don't press the details. Don't take it literally. Look for the point. So the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, did you notice something different here? It doesn't mention that Lazarus got buried. Lazarus may have just been thrown into the city dump or a communal grave somewhere. It doesn't even say he was buried. Now, the Greek here implies that the rich man had a lavish funeral celebration. He probably owned a tomb, and there was quite the, probably more feasting going on at his funeral. So an elaborate celebration of the rich man's death while Lazarus' body was probably thrown somewhere to get rid of it. So the rich man also died and was buried. Now in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Okay, wait a minute here. What is Hades? It says the rich man was buried and then he was in Hades. What's Hades? Well, let's start with the Old Testament version of the afterlife. The Old Testament offers no formal, consistent doctrine concerning the destination and fate of the dead. All who die, good and bad, go to a place in the Hebrew, Sheol, and the Greek form of that, the Greek translation is Hades. Hebrew Sheol, Greek Hades. Now, the New Testament, though a bit more specific, is likewise vague and undogmatic about the preliminary, or some might say intermediary, state abode of the dead. Now, the Hebrews in general believed that the dead did not relinquish their existence, per se. All who died, good, bad, everybody, all who died continued to exist in a region outside or below the earth, uh, somewhere that was inaccessible to God. Well, it was accessible to God, but the dead did not experience his presence there. The dead are described in the Old Testament as shades, shadows, as weary, without strength, and without pleasure. And based on an interesting interpretation of Isaiah 5, 13 through 14, a particular feature of their plight is that they suffer constant thirst. And we'll see that referenced in our parable today. Now, the proper name given to the abode of the dead in Hebrew is Sheol. Sheol was generally believed to be located under the earth in the lower part of the cosmic ocean beneath the roots of the mountains. So the ancient Hebrews, at least some of them, gave it a kind of cosmological, geographical location way down. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament is the abode of the dead regarded as a place of punishment or torture, but the dead do experience some form of suffering as a result of being dead. The New Testament adds very little to the Old Testament description of Sheol. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Greek term Hades is used to translate Sheol. Hades was the Greek term available for translators to use in a, an attempt to translate Sheol with somewhat of an equivalent meaning to the abode of the dead. Now, in Greek mythology, Hades was the Greek god of the underworld, which was often called the house of Hades, or just simply Hades. It was the Greek version of the abode of the dead. It was where Hades supervised the trial and the punishment of the wicked after death. The guilty were tortured 
by demonic female goddesses known as Furies. Now, during the Hellenistic period, Greek and other myths influenced some Jewish thinking and some Jewish literature with regard to their understanding of Hades. However, the authors of the New Testament generally follow the Old Testament understanding of Sheol and do not reflect the Greek mythological understanding of Hades. According to some scholars, there is only one possible exception to that, and that's found in our passage today. Luke chapter 16, verses 23 and 24, where the words torment, agony, and flame are found in connection to Hades, and some people have run wild with their imagination about the meaning of those verses. But our pericope today demands a close look and a careful look at this possibility of Hades, torment, agony, and flame. Is this hell? Well, let's read on. Let's go to now back to verse 23. In Hades, where he was in torment, now, you notice here there's a parallelism. Lazarus is in bliss, comfort, encouragement. The rich man is in torment. Now, isn't that a divine reversal from how the rich man lived his life, how Lazarus lived his life, and now in the afterlife? Things are diametrically reversed. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up. Of course he looked up. Everybody knows Hades' hell is down, and Abraham's bosom evidently is up. In Hades? From Hades? I don't know. He looked up, and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he looks up, and he sees Abraham far away. Well, it couldn't have been too far, because he saw him. And he saw Lazarus by his side. So what does it mean far away? I think we've got some imagery here, some symbolic meaning. Now, notice this. The rich man knew Lazarus. The rich man looked up and saw Lazarus. Can you believe it? That he knew this man? and yet had never done anything, as far as the story goes, to help him, to have any pity on him, to have any mercy on him, nothing at all. Almost unimaginable. But he also looked up and saw Abraham. Now, how did the rich man know Abraham? Well, he'd seen him on YouTube. He'd seen him in Netflix. Do you get my point? How could he have known Abraham? He in reality, he would not have. This is a story, this is a parable, and it's using imagery. So in our story, he looks up and he recognizes Abraham and he recognizes Lazarus. Verse 24. So he called to him, Father Abraham, the father of the faithful. I'm faithful. I'm one of your descendants. I'm a good Jew. I'm a descendant of you, Abraham, oh my father. Father Abraham, have pity on me. Now the rich man wants pity. He wants mercy from Abraham. He never showed Lazarus any pity or mercy, but now he wants pity and mercy in his situation. Didn't care about Lazarus' situation, but he cares very much about his own. Father Abraham, have pity, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame, this fire. And literally the Greek is flame. What's going on here? First of all, he tells Abraham what to do. And then he says, send Lazarus on an errand. Like, he's the messenger boy. He's probably here to serve me, right? So send him on, on an errand for me. And I'm telling you, Abraham, what to do. And I'm asking you to send this messenger boy, Lazarus, to come and do something for me. Oh, the arrogance. I've got one question about the rich man here. Who in hell does he think he is? He's bossing around Abraham. He wants Lazarus to be his messenger boy. But listen to what he says to him. 
Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water? What? Tip of his finger in water? I guess in Abraham's bosom they have water. And Lazarus dips the tip of his finger in it. And cool my tongue. Oh, there's the tongue again. The tongue that tasted all the good things. The tongue of the dogs. The only tongue that never got anything was Lazarus. But now the rich man is in Hades and he wants his tongue touched by Lazarus. Unbelievable. Dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am agony in this fire. Okay, listen to this. You're in agony in a flame. Fire, okay? So what you want and this is a lesson for us if we're ever in a, a building or a house that's on fire. What do we do? We need to get someone to dip the tip of their finger in water and put it on our tongue. That's the answer. Oh, if only the firefighters knew this secret. I'm being sarcastic again. Imagery. Imagery. Or do not take this literally. It is symbolic. And a lot of it has to do here with the tongue. and. Lazarus being a servant boy to the rich man. You know, dip your tip of your finger in water and cool my tongue. I'd say, bring a fire truck, man. Get the fire hoses going, because I'm here in a flame, and I'm in agony. Uh, there's got to be something different going on here in the imagery. And indeed, if you look up Greek word translated agony. It can mean physical, but it also can be mental pain. And it comes from a, gr a root word, which means to grieve. So I could see this as mental agony. I mean, why in the world would you ask for a drop of water if you were in real physical agony? This appears to be, I'm suffering here. I, I don't like what's happening. You're up there. I'm down here. This isn't fair. Somebody help me out here because I'm suffering. I don't like this situation at all. But Abraham replied, son. Abraham addressed him as son. Isn't that nice? He recognized him as a son. Was Lazarus Abraham's son? Could it have been that Lazarus was a Gentile who was not of the lineage of Abraham? I don't know. Is Luke hinting at that? Possibly. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Get it? Good things, bad things, comfort, agony. Agony is the opposite of comfort. The Greek word means consoled, encouraged, strengthened. And again, the Greek word for agony can mean mental anguish and grief. Verse 26. And besides all this, again, the Greek literally is in all of these things, and in all of these things between us and you, interestingly, the you is plural there, between us and all of you, a great chasm, a great gulf has been set in place. It has been established. It has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. They're not able. They don't have the power. Nor can anyone pass or cross over from there to us. Now, if you try to put this on a map, you say, Wait a minute, let me see. Let me get a map of this. There's Abraham's bosom. Uh, there's Hades. Is Abraham's bosom in Hades? And there's a chasm in between. And so there's kind of like good Hades and bad Hades. Well, notice that Abraham's bosom is never called heaven. It's never called paradise. It's just called Abraham's bosom. And the only other reference is to Hades. Now, what is this great chasm between Good Hades and bad Hades. I suggest it's one of the rich man's making. 
It's one of those who are in bad Hades, things that they have established. They have created this chasm. They've created this gulf with their own attitudes, with their own stubbornness, with their own arrogance, with their own desire not to change at all, but to remain as selfish and as arrogant as ever. They have created a gulf between them and people like Lazarus and Abraham in the afterlife. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. Oh, there he goes again. Lazarus is the errand boy. Uh, Abraham telling you what to do, because, you know, I'm in charge here. Abraham, here's what you need to do. Send the errand boy, Lazarus, to do, do some servant work for me, because I am, you well, you know who I am. Send him to my family, for I have five brothers. It's kind of interesting because Judah had five brothers. Is he a type of some of the Jewish folk, some of the Jewish religious leaders? Is he a type of the Pharisees? I think he is a type of the Pharisees. I have five brothers like Judah, and let him warn them, bear witness, give testimony under oath, testify, witness to them, so that they will not also. Come to this place of torment. Now, evidently, he believed that maybe Lazarus couldn't come to him in bad Hades, but Lazarus could go back to where his brothers lived. And notice that this assumes that his brothers are still alive and living somewhere. It also assumes that his brothers are just like him, and he knows that. They're all rich and they're arrogant too. He knows now where they're headed, and he would like to you know, give them a warning. So, this place of torment. And what's the torment? Hear me, church. God does not torture anyone. You hear that? God is God is not torturing. You know who tortures people? Is it, oh, it's the devil. I'm, these people torture themselves. This is self-torture. This is self-agony. This is self-torment. This all comes from the result of arrogance, selfishness, pomposity, ego, idolatry. That's when you have torment. That's when you suffer. That's when you hurt. So we come to this place of torment. Verse 29, Abraham says, he replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Hear them. Comprehend them. How many times did Jesus tell the Pharisees that they in spite of all their self-righteousness, and, and they said they are great law keepers, Jesus told them, you don't listen to the law and the prophets. That was a message to the Pharisees. Why? Well, they thought they were so law-abiding, but did they love God? Well, we just read in our last story, you can't love God and money. And the Pharisees loved money. Not all the Pharisees were rich, but they did have one thing in common. They all loved money. I'm painting with a broad brush there, but for the sake of this story, what Jesus is saying, you Pharisees, you love money. You don't listen to Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets tell you about the Messiah. And if you read them carefully and interpret them, they tell you who the Messiah is. The Messiah is Jesus, and you've rejected me. If you've rejected me, Jesus is really saying you have rejected the law and the prophets. The law of the prophet said, love God. I am the son of God. Love God. Love your neighbor. You don't love your neighbor. Look at how you treat people. Look at how Lazarus was treated. You know, the Old Testament is full of admonitions and commands to take care of the poor and the needy. They ignored them. The rich man ignored them. And Lazarus suffered. They did not listen to Moses and the prophets. Verse 30. No, the rich man says to Abraham. Boy, he, he sure thinks he is something, doesn't he? Now he's telling Abraham, no, you're wrong. You're all wrong. You're all mixed up, Abraham. You don't know what you're talking about. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone, a certain one from the dead, Lazarus, could it be Jesus foreshadowing his own death and it's going to be Jesus? Did the Pharisees accept Jesus when he was raised from the dead? No. 
when Jesus raised another man by the name of Lazarus, Lazarus of Bethany from the dead. Did the Pharisees repent? No, they plotted to kill Lazarus again. It doesn't work. And Jesus is telling his audience, the Pharisees, if you think that, you're wrong. You reject me in your heart. You reject God and love for neighbor, love for the poor and the needy. You've hardened your heart. You set your will against God and on yourself and your possessions. If someone goes from the dead, they will repent. They'll change their minds. They just need a sign. Give them a sign. They never listen to a sign. They'll change their minds. They'll reconsider. They'll rethink. Didn't work for the rich man. Well, it didn't work for the Pharisees. Won't work for his five brothers either. Verse 31, here's the warning. He said to him, if they do not listen, comprehend, understand. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if a certain one rises from the dead. If they don't believe, rely on, trust, have faith in the Moses and the prophets, they haven't obeyed. They've hardened their hearts and their minds, and they won't listen, even if someone rises from the dead. They reject the scriptures, and they love money. And they're headed for agony. And thus, the great reversal. So, what's the point of this parable? It's not a lesson in otherworldly geography. <laughs> That's one thing for sure. Then what is the point of this parable? This parable is directed toward the Pharisees who loved money and sneered at Jesus when he said one cannot serve both God and money. It's idolatry. They committed idolatry. It's a loving warning from Jesus to the Pharisees. Think about the future, Pharisees. Wise up. Like the unjust steward spoken of in the same chapter, they need to see the crisis that they're facing and make changes to their attitude and behavior with their eyes to the future. If they don't respond to the teaching of the law and prophets about who the Messiah is, to love God, love your neighbor, care for the poor and needy, they will not accept Jesus, the Son of God. When one helps the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger at the gate, the sick, the needy. Jesus said, you're doing that to me. When you've done it even to the least of these, you've done it unto me. So by ignoring the poor and the needy, they were also ignoring and rejecting Jesus. By rejecting Lazarus, the rich man actually rejected Jesus. In the teachings of Jesus, and especially for Luke in his gospel in the book of Acts, the sharing of possessions manifest your loving relationship with God and your neighbor. Your deep personal loving relationship with God and loving your neighbor is reflected in how you use your possessions, your wealth, how you share, and how you are generous with others. Jesus is warning the Pharisees and all of us to respond to God's love for him by loving those who are created in his image. We respond by repenting, changing our minds and attitudes and behavior as we're led and empowered by the Spirit to reject obeying and following our own selfish desires to loving God and loving our neighbor. And this love is made manifest in sharing our possessions, our wealth, our money. And with God's work on earth, our local church, people who are doing the work of the gospel, ministries that are preaching the word of God and with our needy neighbors. We should be using our possessions in a very generous way to love God and love our neighbor. What's our response? Well, church folk, Christians, sisters and brothers, let's respond to God's love with generosity, generous donations to his work and to those in need. You say, well, wait a minute, if, if I'm so generous with my local church, with, with ministries, if I'm so generous with the poor and the needy, what's gonna happen to me? Who's gonna take care of me? What about me? 
I'll tell you who's going to take care of you and me. Let's remember our parable. Let's remember Lazarus and the significance of what his name means. What if we become Lazarus? God has help. God has help. God will help. Trust in God. Believe in God. Have faith in Him. He will take care of you, no matter your present condition or situation. If you put God first in your life, and you try to help out and be generous with others, especially those who are in need, God will help you. God will help you. So let's remember that man, Lazarus. Let's remember what his name means. And let's be thankful that whatever our condition is, God has help, and he always will. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit.